Welcome to the Liberty Baptist Sermon Archives. The message you're about to hear was preached at Liberty Baptist Church in Easton, Massachusetts. You can find out more about us or contact us at mylibertybaptist.org or just look us up on Facebook. And now we hope that this message from God's Word will be a blessing to you. Wonderful. Well, we're in Judges chapter number 15 tonight. Last week we saw Samson playing Hollywood. We saw that he uh, was part of a event that was so far removed from reality that it was unbelievable. And we spent some time on that last Sunday. But this Sunday night, uh, is the, message, uh, the title is also another strange one, which has become, become the norm for these Sunday evening messages. But I do have a place that I'm going when I name them what I do. The title of the message this evening is this, Samson plays beanball. Samson plays beanball. Or if there was a subtitle, to the message this evening, it would be this, an eye for an eye gone wrong. An eye for an eye gone wrong. If you've ever watched baseball, you know what beanball is. Certainly it's not an official sport, but the idea of beanball is this, you hit our player, we hit your player. And the problem with beanball is this, is that once you start, it just escalates until typically something really bad happens. And a great example of that would be October 11th, 2003. Game three of the ALCS between your Boston Red Sox and the New York Yankees. History tells us that there are runners at second and third with nobody out, with light hitting utility player Kareem Garcia coming up to the plate. Pedro Martinez appeared visually upset about giving up a 2 0 lead and was in danger of being given the early hook by Grady Little, the manager. Pedro lost his composure and hit Kareem Garcia in the back of the helmet to load the bases. With one out, Garcia would slide hard into second baseman Todd Walker on a double play ball that ended the inning without any more scoring. The fans at Fenway, already restless over giving up the lead, were calling for Garcia's head. Well, so starting in the bottom of the fourth inning for the Red Sox was none other than our good friend Manny Ramirez. Uh, Clemens... Roger Clemens threw a pitch high and tight to back Ramirez off home plate. Uh, Manny took offense to this and started towards the mound. I'll have to ask him about this someday. The dugouts cleared, and Martinez, uh, Pedro Martinez, sprinted towards the field from the dugout with the rest of the players. A scrum ensues from what happens, and during this altercation, uh, Don Zimmer, 72-year-old assistant manager for the New York Yankees, ends up tussling with Pedro Martinez. And what happens is that Pedro Martinez, either on purpose or inadvertently, depending on how you look at it, throws Don Zimmer to the ground. 72-year-old Don Zimmer. And immediately, the fight stops. Everyone looks at Pedro on both teams, and the fight stops. But you know, that's usually the way those types of things work, isn't it? It just kind of gets out of hand because one starts and then someone else goes until someone else goes. And that's kind of the way revenge works. That's the way revenge works. When someone is looking to exact revenge, uh, getting revenge never ends the problem. Getting revenge only seems to escalate the problem further. You know, when it comes to the world, it's no surprise that the world always tries to get revenge when things go wrong. The problem for us tonight is that as children of God, if we are not careful, we can take that revengeful spirit in our own life. And what we can end up doing is instead of being the healers that God has called us to be as the people of God, we can end up escalating the problem until it gets far out of control and far beyond anywhere where we ever imagined it would have gone in the first place. This is what happens to Samson in tonight's message and in tonight's text in Judges chapter 15. He starts playing beanball with the Philistines. Uh, They throw hard at him and three he throws hard at them back and forth over and over until someone gets hurt. Well, far beyond someone getting hurt, people die. And so that's what we see in our text here tonight. So if you would please, if you were able to stand for the reading of God's word in Judges chapter number 15 and we'll begin in verse number one as we look at our text tonight. 
But it came to pass within a while after, in the time of the wheat harvest, that Samson visited his wife with a kid. Now stop right there for a second. There's something very uh, awkward that's about to happen. Do you remember the very last verse of the previous chapter? What happened to his wife? Well, she had been given away to the best man at his wedding. So it says here in our text, and he said, I will go into my wife into the chamber, but her father would not suffer him to go in. And he, her father, said, I verily thought that thou hadst utterly hated her, therefore I gave her to thy companion. Is not her younger sister fairer than she? Take her, I pray thee, instead of her. And there's so much strange things to unpack there. We'll just move on. Verse number three. And Samson said concerning them, Now shall I be more blameless than the Philistines, though I do them a displeasure. And Samson went and caught 300 foxes and took firebrands and turned tail to tail, and put a firebrand in the midst between two tails. And when he had set the brands on fire, he let them go into the standing corn of the Philistines and burnt up both the shocks and also the standing corn with the vineyards and olives. Then the Philistines said, Who hath done this? And they answered, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he had taken his wife and given her to his companion. And the Philistines came up and burnt her and her father with fire. And Samson said unto them, Though ye have done this, yet will I be avenged of you, and after that I will cease. Take note of that verse. And he smote them hip and thigh with a great slaughter, and he went down and dwelt in the top of the rock Edom. And the Philistines went up and pitched in Judah and spread themselves in Lehi. And we'll stop there, and we'll pick up, Lord willing, next week in the same spot. Thank you. You may be seated as we get into our message here tonight. Revenge, it always comes back for you, no matter how much you think that you can be the one that's the exception to the rule. Revenge is an ever, never-ending escalation that takes place uh, between two aggrieved parties, or at least one party that is aggrieved. I read this, and I thought this was interesting, kind of speaks a little bit about what revenge is really like. Several years after helping invent radar, Sir Robert, Robert Watson Watt was caught in a radar trap in his vehicle and arrested for speeding. And he wrote this poem. Pity Sir Robert Watson Watt, strange target of his radar plot. And this, with others, I could mention, a victim of his own invention. <laughs> I like that. But you know, those who create the invention of revenge upon someone else typically get caught in the very same plot back in their own life as well. Uh, revenge is often glorified in Hollywood movies. Revenge is often glorified in television. Revenge is often glorified in literature as a way uh, to not get mad, but to get even. And certainly in the world, it makes all the sense in the world, but yet to the child of God, this is not what God has called us to do. One, uh, because uh, it's not as effective as the world says that it is, but two, because we have a higher calling uh, as believers and God has told us to be different from the world. And you can see what happens here in Judges chapter number 15 is this escalation that takes place. Uh, one, then the other, then one, then the other, back and forth and back and forth. And it starts with Samson going to see his wife. After this whole escapade that took place in Judges chapter number 14, uh, Samson departed and for a time and a season was away from his wife and apparently was unaware that his wife had been given away uh, to his companion. Remember his quote-unquote companion from the wedding feast uh, a few days before. And so he wants to go and see his wife, and he wants to go uh, have relations with his wife. And so it says at the beginning of the chapter that he goes and talks to the father of the home and says, I would like to see my wife. And his father-in-law said, you know, it's funny that you mention it. You know, now that you're here, I thought you hated her. And so what I ended up doing was I took your wife and I gave your wife to your companion from the wedding party. But hey, don't worry about it. She does have a younger sister. And if you'd like to have the younger sister, then you can have her to wife instead. And of course, that was unsatisfactory to Samson and certainly a very odd thing for the father-in-law to say. But Samson was wrong. Could we just start by saying this? Samson was wrong. There was no reason for his wife to be given away by his father-in-law to 
his companion. But yet that's exactly what happened. Now, Samson has a couple options that he can uh, use at this point, is that he can try to act as a child of God and uh, try to act in a way that is honorable, uh, or uh, he can try to take revenge. And that's exactly what happens. And so what he does in the following verses is that he catches 300 foxes and he puts them tail to tail. Now, I don't know exactly how this completely works out. I've thought about this before and I've seen some ideas and commentaries. And I'll be honest with you, when you find things like this and maybe you say to yourself, Pastor, it doesn't make sense for Samson to take 300 foxes and be able to put them together. I would say this, when the Bible just says it, I get to the point where I don't want to think too much about it. If the Bible says it, that's what happened. And we can get to the point where we try to take what we know about the world today and what we know about how we would handle things today and say, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. But I know this, that here's a man with extraordinary strength. Here's a man that has been empowered by God. And so if it says that he's caught these foxes and maybe he's found a way to put a contraption between their tails. And of course, if that's the case, they're going to be pretty upset anyway. And he lights these things on fire. And then what does he do? He sends them out into the fields of the Philistines. Now, by the way, does he light on fire the fields of his father-in-law? That doesn't seem to be the indication here, does it? Because that's what revenge does. That's what the beanball mentality does. You hurt me, I'll hurt you more. You get me, I'll get you harder. And that's what he does. And he takes some of the crops of the Philistines and he burns them completely with fire. Now, this was mentioned to me last week, and I, I know this was mentioned in the previous chapter in verse number four, but we do understand that God is using all of this to further his purpose. God is using all of this to be able to release the Israelites from the shackles of the Philistines who have uh, been lording over them for some time, which was never God's intention. Read the book of Joshua if you're not sure about that. We understand that God is using these actions to further world events and to further his plan. But yet, does that mean that God is pleased with him acting in such a way? I believe the answer would be no. And I think we need to be clear about that and remind ourselves of that. God is so big and God is so great, he can even take our sinful nature and our sinful mistakes and use them to be able to bring himself glory and to be able to further his own agenda. So what happens? His wife is given away. Samson escalates and he says, all right, well, I will burn down uh, some of the fields of the city uh, as retribution for what's happened to me. Well, some of the people who had their fields burned are now very upset. And they go back to the father-in-law and they say, what happened here? Uh, why did this happen? They realize that Samson was upset because of what the father-in-law had done. And what was their response? To de-escalate? No, they decided to burn the woman and burn the father-in-law with fire. That's what it says right there in verse number six at the end of the verse. And the Philistines came up and burnt her and her father with fire. Now, obviously, that is an escalation. And again, uh, it is an awful thing to take place. But Samson is still not done uh, because there's going to be another escalation. Again, in verse number seven, and Samson said unto them, though ye have done this, yet will I be avenged of you. And of course, that word avenged there is, is a buzzword. And keep that in mind. I will be avenged of you. And after that, I will cease. And boy, let me tell you, that is what revenge always wants to sell you. I could even put it this way. That's what bitterness always wants to sell you. I'm going to just do this and then I'll be done. Actually, could we put it this way? That's what sin always sells you, isn't it? Uh, I, I know when I can stop. I can quit any time I want to. That's what sin always says. And certainly that's true of revenge. Listen, just one more time and then I'm done. And so what does he do? It says he smote them hip and thigh with a great slaughter. And he went down and dwell in the top of Rock Etram. Uh, I don't know uh, a lot about what happened in verse number eight. But I do know just from doing some study that that phrase, he smote them hip and thigh, means that he smote them with a great cruelty. Maybe we could even put it this way, that he found a way to uh, harm some of these Philistines in a very cruel manner. It wasn't just that he wanted to kill them, is that he wanted to make a point. And it wasn't just what I see here, that he killed those who were part of the death. It was a great slaughter. He found a lot of Philistines 
and he killed them all. So do you see what happens? There was Samson's wife being given away. So he burns the fields with fire. So they kill uh, the father-in-law and the wife. And so he kills a great slaughter of Philistines. And on and on it goes and on and on it escalates. And that's what revenge does. It constantly is the desire uh, to continue on to try to get even. Now, I've written this down as a definition for revenge because justice is a real thing. And, you know, we should want to seek justice. Uh, you know, Micah 6, 8 says that we should uh, do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with thy God. Our God is a God of justice. And certainly justice is something that is a wonderful thing uh, for us to look for in this life. But revenge is different. And this is maybe my working definition of revenge. And uh, you can take it as it is. And But this is something that I think really encapsulates what revenge truly is, particularly when compared to justice. Revenge is the unjust desire to receive personal satisfaction from the suffering of someone else who may have hurt you. Revenge is the unjust desire to receive personal satisfaction from the suffering of someone else who may have hurt you. That's what revenge is. Uh, and I believe that would be what we see here with Samson is that it wasn't just that he wanted to get uh, justice for what had happened. No, he wanted revenge. He even said, I want to avenge myself. Uh, and he found people that weren't even involved necessarily with what had taken place in the first place. And he did it for one reason. He thought, if I can get my revenge, if I can avenge myself upon these people, I will be satisfied. And the awful secret about revenge is that you're never satisfied when you receive revenge. Now, maybe you ask yourself this tonight. Well, pastor, there's an Old Testament law. And I, and, and I know you know it, pastor, but it goes something like this. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I mean, isn't this what we see here in the book of Judges? I mean, isn't it simply an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth? I mean, isn't that... Old Testament justice, isn't that the Old Testament way of doing things? And although sometimes that's typically what's brought up in texts like this, I don't believe it's comparable for several different reasons. And I want you to do this. Go ahead and turn away from there and go to Exodus chapter number 21. Exodus chapter number 21. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Exodus chapter 21. Of course, we see the giving of the law here. Exodus chapter 20 deals with what we would call the Ten Commandments today, but there were other commandments that were given as well. In Exodus chapter 21, look at verse number 22, where it says this, If men strive and hurt a woman with child, so that her fruit depart from her, uh, and yet no mischief follow, uh, he shall be surely punished, according as the woman's husband will lay upon him, and shall pay as the judges determine. And if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. And if a man smite the eye of his servant or the eye of his maid, that it perish, uh, he shall let him go free for the eye's sake. And if he smite out the manservant's tooth or the maidservant's tooth, he shall let him go free uh, for the tooth's sake. Now, I've taken just a very small selection here from a lot of different laws that have been given by God in the previous chapter as well as the chapters that are to follow uh, but I find this interesting that when it talks about an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth immediately when we think of those verses I think a lot of times people think of revenge you hurt me I'm going to hurt you back you take my eye I'm going to take your eye you take my tooth I'm going to take your tooth uh, kind of like uh, uh, vigilante justice the old west what are they going to do an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth well that's not what I see here in fact, as I look at this text and I look at the eye for the eye and the tooth for the tooth, and I particularly look at the verses that follow, I see this, that this is a law not of revenge, but rather a law of restraint. It's not a law of revenge, but it's a law of restraint. Why is that? It was put in place to ensure equitable justice. We have something similar in what we would call the Eighth Amendment here today. What is that? that we make sure that in the United States we don't have what's called cruel and unusual punishment. 
The idea is if there is a crime that takes place, that you cannot uh, have a judge that takes out far greater uh, penalty upon the perpetrator than what is deserved for that. Could we say that in many ways the Eighth Amendment is this, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? Equitable justice. And so we can't look at Samson and say, oh, sure, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You hurt me and I hurt you. Well, no, because what it says here is that when justice is taken, it's to be true justice in the sense that it's equitable. It's not, you hurt me, I'll hurt you more. And then you hurt me more, then I'll hurt you more. And before you know it, nobody even knows where it started. And Don Zimmer's laying on the ground. Because that's what happened spiritually here in Judges chapter number 15. By the way, an eye for an eye was to be utilized by the government. That was the government's job. These are laws for the people of Israel and their government. In fact, there we could even go to there. Uh, we're not going to for the sake of time, but uh, there was the law of the avenger of blood. If someone was murdered, uh, there was the avenger of blood that could go and get justice for someone that was of a family member that was murdered. But even then, there were strict laws that were put in place by the government to make sure that they just didn't, in cold blood, take out someone that they believed murdered a family member. That there had to be due process that took place and that was done uh, by the government of Israel at that time. We also see this. Do you know who the true avenger is in life? It's God. And now we're kind of getting to the meat of where we need to go tonight. A lot of people here have been wrong in a lot of different ways. I mean, it, we want to really discourage people tonight. Let's have testimony time instead of praises and say, hey, who's been wrong here before? Uh, <laughs> I think we could have a lot of hands up here tonight and we would leave here very discouraged this evening. But what I realized by looking at our text here is this, is that the true avenger of justice is none other than God himself. Jeremiah 30, verse 11, For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee, though I will make a full end of all nations, whither I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee, but I will correct thee in measure, and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. God saying, I will be the one who corrects you. What about Psalm 94, 1? O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongeth, O God, to whom vengeance belongeth, show thyself. What about Romans 12, 19? Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. Unfortunately, a lot of us want to change that verse to this. Uh, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Not saith the Lord, but saith me. Because there's something so satisfying, it would seem, to know that someone who has harmed you receives harm back. To know that someone who has hurt you gets hurt back. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Well, that wasn't an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth in Judges chapter number 15. It was an eye, uh, and then it was two eyes, and then it was a whole head because it kept escalating over and over and over again. And by the way, man is not to use an eye for an eye as a method of vengeance. Uh, some say something like this. I don't get angry, I get even. You ever heard that before? I don't get angry. I get even. Well, you can certainly have that attitude, but don't say that you have that attitude as a child of God because that's not what God calls us to do. Leviticus 19, 18. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Do you realize thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself originated in the Old Testament? A lot of times we attribute it to Jesus. Well, we can attribute it to Jesus because he is the word. But at the same time, uh, this was not coming from Jesus. First of all, we find it in that very same Old Testament where we find an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And God does that because we set the bar for self-love very high. We all love ourselves. And God says this, as much as you love yourself, you better find a neighbor and you love them the same way. Uh, and you shall not bear any grudge against the children of the people. Romans 12, uh, uh, Romans 12, that's not Romans 12, uh, but be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. I believe it's Romans 13, 1. Uh, I've heard this said before as well. Revenge is often like biting a dog because the dog bit you. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, again, revenge often seems to feel good 
but revenge doesn't end up being what we anticipate it to be. Do this. Turn to Matthew chapter 5 this evening. Matthew chapter 5. The flesh tells you that revenge is natural, but the Spirit should tell you that revenge is unnatural for the child of God. Matthew chapter 5. Look at verse number 38. What did Jesus say about this? An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now, certainly Jesus was not saying the law was uh, incorrect. When we look at the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is not trying to replace the law. What he's saying is this. He is saying, uh, or rather, he's not trying to say that the law is of no value. What he's saying is this. He's looking at the heart behind the law. You know, I haven't lusted. You know, like the rich young ruler says, oh, I've kept all these things from my youth. But Jesus Christ exposed that in his heart, he hadn't done that at all. And so here, there would be some that would say, you've heard it been said, verse number 38, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Again, Jesus is not saying that that was incorrect. What he's saying is, let's talk about the heart behind that. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at, thy clo at the law, and take away thy coat, thou shalt let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not away. Now, we'll stop there. Jesus says this, for those who do you wrong, uh, he, he's not saying that you should actively look uh, to harm yourself uh, in a harmful situation. He's not saying uh, that if there's danger to just plunge yourself headlong into it. But what he's saying this is that if someone is to smite you on the cheek, what is the natural urge of someone that is going to physically harm you? It's to get that fist ready uh, and to uh, respond in kind. But God says this. Now, we're not talking about self-defense here. We're talking about just the fact that someone slugs you and you're ready to slug them back. Okay, let's help you. Someone cuts you off. Okay, now we hit closer to home. And you cut them off back. Someone cusses at you. You say, Pastor, I wouldn't cuss them back. I've said this before, but you know you can curse without using a cuss word. Job cursed the day he was born. He had nothing of value to say. And just because we don't uh, use curse words maybe at someone else, and if you do, by the way, you need to stop doing that. But at the same time, uh, just because we don't doesn't mean we're responding in a spirit-led fashion. Someone smite you, you know, turn the other cheek. Uh, if someone sue you at the law, take away your coat, let him have thy cloak also. You are, uh, are uh, literally saying, this is, this, you know, it's my right to have it, but I'm going to go it above and beyond. What about this? And whoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. The idea was a Roman soldier was allowed to take a private citizen and force them into carrying their gear for a mile, but was not allowed to have them carry that gear for more than a mile. And so imagine a soldier uh, uh, says, all right, your mile's completed. Give me my pack back. And you say this, you know what? We've been enjoying this trip so much. Let's just go one more. Now, do you imagine that would make a difference in a soldier's life? you imagine that would make them wonder, what's different about this person? And what we see here is not a pattern of escalation, but rather we see a pattern of de-escalation. That instead of saying, I'm going to take this fire and throw gasoline on it, what we say is, instead of we take this fire and throw the spirit on it. And I think that's what's lacking for us as believers at times, is that when we are wrong and we go through difficulty, we look at ways to try to make the problem uh, perpetuate instead of finding ways to see God get glory in the situation. Do you realize if you've been wrong, it is the perfect opportunity to be able to show that you are a Christian, and it's the perfect opportunity to show uh, that you are able uh, to be able to handle things differently than the world. And again, I'm not saying that you should put yourself in an unsafe situation. I'm not saying uh, that you should allow yourself to be embezzled uh, of thousands of dollars of funds. I mean, you can take this far too far. But what I'm saying is, is that in the natural course of life, 
we are wronged on a regular basis, uh, whether it's very small things or very petty things or whether it's very large things. But we need to make sure that as believers, I mean, just kind of zooming out at this instead of uh, zooming in closely at it, but if we were to take just the, the, the larger framework of this, that we as believers should look at the situations of life where someone wants to play beanball with us and they want to throw at our head, that instead of throwing at their head back, we ought to say, you know what? You want to play? That's fine. I'm not playing. Do you realize that someone who looks for revenge is out of control? Because who knows where it's going to end? Samson says, no, I do this and it's done. What Samson didn't realize was that a life lived exactly like that would end with him crushed under a load of rubble, blind, committing an act of taking his own life because of this very nature that would bubble up in his life over and over and over again. But instead of having that attitude, we say this, you know what I'm going to do? That when I have these petty things in life that kind of get me frustrated, or I have some of these big things in life that, that really uh, are really difficult things, I'm going to respond with the Spirit so that I have opportunity for God to use this situation to make a difference in my family, to make a difference with my spouse, uh, to make a difference uh, with the people at work, to make a difference with all those things. God can do that. I had someone just a few weeks ago, Peyton, sit up, please. I had someone just a few weeks ago uh, that was telling me that a few years ago they had a coworker that they, when I say that they wanted to kill them, I don't think I'm being literal. But how many of you ever had a coworker where you thought, you know, if I, well, I don't want to dwell on that too much, but we've all had that coworker where it just was not good. And I talked with this person and prayed with this person and, and talked about that. You know, I just had a conversation with them just this last week and they said, you're not going to believe this, but do you know who I've been able to witness to the last few weeks at work? That over about a three or four year period, just responding in a spirit led way. And I don't, I'm not there at that workplace every day. I don't know. I imagine it would have been very frustrating, but what I would assume would be living life in a spirit-led way instead of throwing at their head and throwing back and throwing and throwing and throwing. Guess what happened? Here's an opportunity for that person to get saved. Now, will they get saved? I don't know, but I do know this. Is God glorified through that? He is. And that doesn't happen when we just find petty ways to get even. Uh, turn quickly, Romans chapter 12. We're going to look at this and then we're going to be done. Romans chapter 12. Look at verse number 17. Recompense no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men, if it be possible. Now, is it always possible? You're going to find out the answer is no. But if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Now, is it possible? Again, it is not always possible. But we are to do everything we can as believers to try to live in this fashion. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. We just read this, but rather give place unto wrath. Uh, that, that, that phrase, give place, literally means to step aside. You put it into your, its place, and you go to your own place. Could we use another sports phrase for this? Put it in a separate corner. Wrath's on that side. Uh, you go to the opposite corner, and you stay away from it. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, honk your horn at them. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, give him a piece of your mind instead. Feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. By the way, you see that in Proverbs 25, 21, and 22 as well. Here's what it comes down to. Be not overcome of evil but overcome evil with good. What happens with the spirit of revenge? It will overcome you. That spirit of revenge, that spirit of bitterness will overcome you. Like one of my favorite sayings, bitterness is the poison that you drink expecting someone else to die. And that's what that spirit does, is that you take it in and you are waiting for the other person to be harmed. And what ends up happening is you are the one that is harmed by the spirit of revenge. What do I see from this? Don't intentionally bring harm to an enemy. If there's someone who has harmed you, find a way to be a blessing to them. 
If there's someone that's done you wrong just in the day-to-day things of life, maybe you don't even know their name, you don't even know who they are, show them grace. Show them Jesus Christ instead of showing them a side of you that you probably don't want the people at church to know or showing them a side of you that you don't want those people who are close to you to know. Don't intentionally bring harm to someone who has acted as an enemy. But can I also say this? Because I don't know that we dwell or, or have as much difficulty with that. We may. But I would also say this. Don't withhold good from an enemy. I think that's where it can get hard. I mean, I may not necessarily go out of my way to hurt somebody, but do you know if I go out of my way to not help someone who has been an enemy, what have I done? Well, I have violated what God has said to do here in Romans chapter 12, and I have actually exemplified the spirit of revenge simply by not doing what was within my power to be able to do for them. You know, there's certain people in town here that I've had run-ins with whether it's from trying to give them the gospel or whether it's for uh, things that we've stood for as a church that there are people here that maybe aren't as appreciative of that. You know, if I knew that someone was in that situation that had been unkind to me or unkind to our church and I found out that they were in a difficulty that I knew that we could help with and I said that I wouldn't help, what does that speak to? Does that speak more about them or does that speak more about me? We need to be careful about that. We need to be watchful about that. Don't withhold good from an enemy. By the way, there's biblical support for that. Exodus 23, 4, if thou meet thine enemy's ox or his ass going astray, thou shalt surely bring it back to him again. That is a biblical command, not just found there either, but he says this, if you find someone's animal going astray and you know who it belongs to and you don't like him, you don't just get to walk past it. You stop, but but I might have to go out of my way. It doesn't matter. But I might have to expend some energy. It doesn't matter. But I might have to give that animal some of my own feed to be able to to get. It doesn't matter. Uh, do that, uh, and if you don't, then you are still exemplifying the spirit of revenge. And then finally, I would say this to you tonight, and maybe this is the most important: don't ever expect the exacting of revenge to bring you peace, joy, happiness satisfaction or closure. Don't ever expect the exacting of revenge to bring you peace, joy, happiness, satisfaction, or closure. Let me ask you this. Did it for Sam? It did. It doesn't. Why would we be starting with unrighteous fruit and expect the seeds of that unrighteous fruit to then bear the fruit of righteousness? If we want peace, joy, happiness, satisfaction, or closure, it doesn't come from the fruit of revenge. It comes from the fruit of Matthew chapter 5. It comes from the fruit of Romans chapter number 12. Oh, so, sure, throwing a fastball right at someone's head, it may feel good for a second. But when the next fastball comes at your head, it's not going to feel any good anymore. And it won't feel good when someone gets hurt far beyond what you expected. The eye for the eye and the tooth for the tooth. Not what God intended it to be. But let's not have that spirit tonight. And let's make sure that we don't withhold good from those who have made themselves enemies to us. Let's heap those coals of fire on their heads and overcome evil with good, not to be overcome with evil ourselves. Thank you for listening to this sermon from the pulpit of Liberty Baptist Church. If this message was a blessing to you, or if there's any way we can serve you, please let us know by contacting us at info at mylibertybaptist.org, or you can visit us this Sunday at 800 Washington Street in Easton, Massachusetts. May the Lord bless you as you grow in His Word.